Hey everybody, it's Galmadex, and welcome back to the Murders at Karlov Manor waiting room. All we've got is Cube for another week, but Murders at Karlov Manor is just around the corner. I'm very excited for that, but let's play some more Cube nonsense, shall we? For our pack one pick one, as always, we've got incredible options. We've got Meat Hook for a board wipe, a Braid for really efficient removal. History of Benalia is a little army in a can, multiple 2-2s two of Vigilance that get buffed up later. Lurus is a fun build around. We have done that once before with a Rakdos deck, but we could try uh, Orzhov this time around, like Black White Lurus or something like that could be cool. If we're the luckiest drafter in the universe, we could take Lurus and wield a Meat Hook Massacre. That does count as a mana value two or less card for the Lurus. Yeah, sweet pack with a lot of different directions to go. I think I will go with Lurus. Worst case scenario, we can always run Lurus in just any black or white aggressive deck that has a lot of permits with mana value 2 or less. We don't have to have Lurus in the companion slot for this card to be pretty dang good. It's definitely main deckable. The hybrid mana cost makes it pretty flexible. We get to start with white aggro or, uh, or black aggro, really. And here, there are more black spells, so there is a higher chance of wheeling a black card, but I do like the white spell better than any of these black ones. The Adonto Vanguard is just very good in an aggro deck. Two mana for basically a 3-1 while it's attacking, and you can just spend a bunch of life to give it an indestructible till end of turn when you're the more aggressive player. That life total is, uh, is just a resource. It is very worth it to trade some life to keep your threat on the board. So I like Vanguard a lot. These black spells, again, pretty great as well, but I think Vanguard is better, so I'm going to head in that direction with the Lurus, and maybe we'll go black-white and still get to wield these black cards, and then have the easiest to cast Lurus in the world, where both of our colors work for that hybrid mana. Pick number three. All right, well, now there's Chandra, Torture Defiance, one of the best cards in the cube. So is Breach the Multiverse out of black, but that is seven mana. I guess Chandra's a, a permanent, so we couldn't run Lurus in the companion slot in a red-white Chandra aggro deck, but Boros aggro with Vanguard, Lurus, and Chandra feels like a really good start. Breach the Multiverse, while it is a really good finisher, because it's a seven mana spell, feels a lot more like mid-range at best, um, but really a control finisher for the most part. It's definitely not an aggro card. You're not making it to seven mana or trying to make it to seven mana with aggressive decks like how we're headed right now. Yeah, I think I'm still going to take Chandra, even though it means that if we go Boros, we don't get to play Lurus in the companion slot. I just think she makes a lot more sense with our first two picks than Breach does. Breach is much more of a control finisher. And we're pretty happy to have taken Chandra, because now there's Bone Crusher Giant, which is a fantastic two-for-one. It's a removal spell on a stick. It's your two-mana stomp removal spell and a three-mana four-three. So not only do you get a removal spell and a creature all in one, but the creature is very aggressively costed too. Four power for only three mana, and it shoots your opponent when they target it. Really like Bone Crusher Giant. Cutdown's good too if we were in, uh, in black-white right off the bat. And Wedding Announcement's solid, too, for, like, Mono White from now, but Bone Crusher's my favorite card in the pack, and we will take that. Now we have Luminarch Aspirant, incredible white aggro card, putting a plus and plus one counter on any creature you control at the beginning of combat on your turn. So the turn you play it, it turns itself into a 2-2, if nothing else. Then by the time that it uh, is no longer summoning sick and it can attack, it's a 3-3. So even by itself, it's just an incredible snowballing threat. Uh, but it's even better when you get to put those counters wherever you want them. Pick six, we have Older Raven Guard. Pretty solid alchemy card. You're spitting tokens of your attacking creatures into your hand. Um, collective effort is just a bit too much mana for how narrow it is, in my opinion. Mana Tithe is pretty good. Mana Tithe, no one ever expects the Mana Tithe from the Boros aggro deck. So they just tap out for that board wipe, turn four, turn five, and then you just mana tithe, and it's like, well, I guess I lose. So I kind of like mana tithe over these two. Folder, I think, is probably better than collective effort, but I think mana tithe is probably better than the other two. Pick seven, I do want to take interaction really highly, like lightning strike. 
This is great cheap interaction, great cheap removal, but I have been very impressed by Zealous Conscripts in the past. It just stacks up so much extra damage out of nowhere that it is completely game-ending, completely back-breaking a lot of the time. So it's a 3-3 haste itself, and it steals your opponent's best blocker. So a 3-3 haste that shuts off one of the blocks that your opponent was planning on, and it gives you that best blocker as another one of your attackers. So it shuts off their best blocker, adds an additional 3 damage, and adds damage equal to that blocker's power to your opponent. So it is uh, really hard to play around your opponent just conscripting you to death at the top end of their aggro curve, so I like the card a lot, and we'll take that there. Jaya is one of the weakest Planeswalkers in the cube, she's just really slow, kind of dirtily, definitely not an aggro Planeswalker. I'll just take a Thraben Inspector, I guess, which I'm not very excited about either, but maybe it's better to speculate on a Godless Shrine here if we want to go three color, but I think we're just going to be Boros at this rate. I'm going to take Inspector. Pick 9, History of Benalia came all the way back. That is excellent for us. Get a couple 2-2s two and then buff them all. Get extra damage in. We might even have other knights. No, that's a soldier. That's a soldier. Of course, we have other soldiers. Uh, Urbrast Forge, a very nice finisher against control decks. One of their best tools against your aggro deck is going to be casting a board wipe to clear out everything that you've played and then just take over the game from there. Well, board wipes aren't going to deal with the Urbrask's Forge, and this will eventually still kill them. So really good in a control matchup. Not the greatest otherwise. It's pretty slow otherwise, but I think it is worth main decking for the times that you do end up against control. Because then it's just incredible. I don't think we're playing a Woodland Acolyte or a Virtue of Courage. I don't think these are very good at what they're doing. Just put a Virtue in the side. Now we'll play a Chandra, I guess. Probably more likely than Ginger Brute. I mean, we have Ginger Brute combos. We can put counters on it with Luminarc Aspirant. But I honestly just don't know what Ginger Brute's doing in the cube. Just not at the power level of most cube cards. All right, pack two, pick number one. We've got a Fabled Passage for Red White Fixing which I guess is probably just the pick here. I don't think this pack's very strong for us. I have had a very sordid and just unfortunate history with Abbot of Carol Keep. I am used to playing this card and then not having enough mana to play whatever it exiles no matter when I cast this thing. So I have just never been impressed by that. I like Spirited Companion, but similar to Ginger Brute, it's just not quite as powerful as almost anything else in the cube. Restoration Angel is pretty cool. Enter the Battlefield Effects is probably the best non-land card here, but I think we just take Fabled Passage. Virtue of Loyalty is nice as well. It's a two-drop creature on curve, and then it's going to slowly buff up your board over time with that five-man enchantment half, but again, as aggressive as you can get in Boros in the Arena Cube, or really just in almost any color pair in the Arena Cube, you've got a lot faster ways to win the game for like five mana. This doesn't end up being very impressive, so... I'll just take the passage and help our mana base a little bit. Pack 2, pick 2 is similarly unexciting. Terror of the Peaks is a little bit slow for a 5 mana finisher. Micaeus is a little bit slow in general. Doesn't do anything till the turn after you play him. Then you can start buffing up your board, which is decent, but I don't know. I guess I'll take Micaeus because he's more flexible and technically uh, could go with Luris where we can recast this from Grave with Luris, but we can't recast Terror from Grave, so there's that little synergy, even if Luris isn't in the companion slot. A few very solid cards here. Welcoming Vampire is a card draw engine, as long as we're spitting out cheap creatures. Skyclave Apparition is a removal spell on a stick. Deal with your opponent's best permanent until they get rid of the Apparition, and then they just get an Illusion back. I think I'll take the Apparition, but these are both very good. Uh, Light Up the Stage is also decent. But if I wanted to take card draw, I'd just take Welcoming Vampire over, light up the stage. Yeah, I think we take Apparition here. Well, I guess... I don't know. Vampire is a much easier mana cost. It's not double red or double white like Apparition's double white. And maybe I can find other interaction, just all the cheap burn spells instead. We'll see. 
couple fine cheap burn spells here like electrostatic blast flames of the firebrand definitely nothing super impressive like lightning bolt or any of the two mana deal fours or anything like that um but these are fine um so i've already got a bone crusher for two mana burn but that's it right now probably supposed to take one of these burn spells but I really like Usher of the Fallen. It's the one mana 2 one that spits out more creatures every time you attack with it. And wow, now I'm so happy about that choice because we just get the best burn spell of a literal lightning bolt pick 5 anyway. So now I can just spend this pick on the burn spell since I spent last pick on the Usher. And we get a significantly better burn spell this way. Yeah, that is pretty sweet. Uh, Ranger of Eos would be fine for this deck. We've got Machaeus, which is like the biggest combo for the Ranger. Because you play this and you grab some cheap creatures, right? You usually just grab an Usher and a Dragon's Rage Shadow or something. But if you have X mana creatures like Machaeus, then this can grab a big finisher too. We do have that, so that'd be a fun pickup. Um, but Selfless Savior would also be good, so if either of those come back, we'll be happy. This is easily Lightning Bolt though, because people are going to be competing over taking that. Pick 6, Legion's Landing is always nice, just a 1 mana 1 1 lifelink are not the most impressive thing in the universe, but once you attack with 3 or more creatures, you get to ramp up. You put another planes on your board, and when you run out of stuff to do, that planes also gets to pump out some vampire tokens, make you a little more resilient to board wipes. So I'm a pretty big fan of Legion's Landing. <sighs> Speaking of cards I'm a pretty big fan of, Adeline's one of the best cards in the cube, one of the best just mono white aggro cards ever printed you get to spit out an additional 1-1 human that's tapped and attacking every time you attack, and Adeline has power equal to number of creatures you control, so she's providing more creatures to buff her own power. She's a giant vigilant threat, and I don't know, she's just incredible. Wingmate Rock's also pretty good, but Adeline is insane for that mana cost, so we'll take her here. Pick 8, we've got an Inferno Titan for the top of the curve, or a Lyra for the top of the curve. I think Inferno Titan's the better card, but it's a bit more expensive. I could also take Lutri, because Lutri's a free companion. I don't know, I think I'm still just taking Inferno Titan, though, because we're not really doing any Lutri things with this deck. You don't have to do any Lutri things for Lutri to be good, because it's just a free 41st card to your deck. I don't know, I'm just kind of a... Uh... Tired of having Lutri sitting on the sidelines so often. <laughs> Got Spirit and Companion or Abbot of Carol Keep here. I don't like either of these very much, but I'll take Spirit and Companion just because of how bad Abbot has been for me in the past. Uh, pick 10 is nothing. Pick 11 is nothing. I mean, we could put Light of the Stage in here. Oh, we got both the burn spells back. That's nice. Um... Low enough instant sorcery count, I don't think we're getting much value from the uh, the boon that Electrostatic Blast gives us, so we'll take Flames for the Firebrand to split up that damage. Okay, we're definitely not playing Brotherhood's End. We could maybe play a Grim Lava Mancer. Um, not a Goblin Bombardment, though. Alright, pack three. Pick number one. Robber of the Rich is the best aggro card here. I like Volcanic Spite for removal as well, but if last pack was anything to go by, we can probably get that back. But Robber of the Rich is great. It's a hasty threat that also draws you a bunch of cards. It's drawing the cards out of your opponent's deck, so you don't know if they'll be useful cards, but draws you those cards nonetheless. Robber's very fun, very strong. Take him here. Pack 3, pick 2. Here are some great removal spells. It's also the really good Maul of the Skyclaves. This gets a ton of extra damage in really quickly. Plus two, plus two, flying first strike. It's also pretty resilient to board wipes. If your opponent is on a more controlling deck and you've got some cheap threats on the board already, it's usually better to just slap a Maul onto something than play a third threat turn three. So that's a way to keep making your board even bigger without overextending into a board wipe so i like the mall a lot i think i will take it over obliterating bolt or searing blood or mishra's command because we'll probably get one of these back um, i think there is definitely a pick order there bolt would be the best for us searing blood would be the second best um because it's just harder to cast and then command is just the the least efficient it's a ton of mana for the removal but i think any of those would be decent additions to the deck 
Speaking of decent additions to the deck, here's the more expensive version of Bone Crusher Giant, but still a good card. This one is 3 mana for 3 damage for the instant adventure instead of 2 mana for 2 damage, but then it's a 2 mana 3-1. It's got extra tests. Text gives your instants and sorceries lifelink, so it makes our lightning bolts a lightning helix gains that life there, which is very cute. Uh, but that extra text is is rarely relevant. It's basically just a burn spell at a two mana three one all on one card, which is still pretty dang good. Pack three, pick number four. We've got an ossification to actually clear out some big blockers from our opponent. I think that's going to be pretty important for us. To have a way to clear a path against really big blockers, so I'll take that over Thalia here. This is a good Thalia. It's not the best Thalia. The two mana Thalia is the best one, but this one is still pretty good. Like if we play against a five color Golos deck that's trying to play all non basics, a bunch of fetch lands and a field of the dead, like they just they're so dead. All their lands hit the board tap no matter what. They can't use their shock lands or anything. And when they play their big creatures to try to stabilize or their, their zombies, they just also hit the board tap, so they still don't have blockers up. This card is really rude against that exact deck and kind of annoying for three color control decks, but for the most part, not the most insane card. And Ossification is likely a little better for us. Uh, pick five, Dauntless Bodyguard is great. It's just a one mana, two one to play on curve, but if you hit it later, you can play it and protect your Adeline, something really important like that. Big fan of that card. Beaumont Courier is also really good. You get a bunch of haste damage in and you get a whole new hand because you're putting a bunch of cards under the Beaumont Courier and then once you're out of cards in hand, you sack the Courier, swap out your hand with the Couriers. Um, so that's the second best, but Bodyguard is the best here. We'll take that. Pack three, pick six. Ooh, it's literal Ember Cleave. It's going to be hard to get me to not take that, but I have seen this uh, Alchemy card being pretty wild. I think I still have to just take Ember Cleave. I mean, it's... It's the OG, well, not OG, it's from like 2019, Magic's from like 1993 or something, but to me, for, for Magic Arena players, it's like the original mono red, just destruction. I'm going to take Ember Cleave. Pick seven, we've got Paulo Vitor Domo de Rosa to annoy our opponents to death with hand disruption and a 3-1 flyer all off one card. The card is pretty great, uh, but it's also very annoying. And I do have to mention that. Pick number eight now. Uh, we don't have a ton of spells for young Pyromancer, so I don't think that'll be super good. Facebreaker could be okay. I think we've got plenty of other good three drops, though, so I'd rather just take a two mana creature like Kellen. And Kellen's actually decent for this kind of deck. We've got plenty of mana value three or less creatures to potentially draw into. Pick nine, we've got In the Trenches which is interesting because it's a three mana anthem to buff the whole board, then six mana removal. Those are both not very good for their mana costs, but stack them both together and maybe it's okay. Felidar Retreat is theoretically good. The problem is that you play it and then you want to draw more lands, but that means you want to flood out in an aggro deck, which you never want to do. Generally speaking, it's, it's a weird card that never plays as good as it looks. It plays solid, like it's really good in regular draft, but cube draft standards is a bit too bit too dirtily. Um, Searing Blood's going to be hard for us to cast. Red is basically just a splash at this point. I guess I'm actually supposed to take Mishra's Command over the double red card because it's just easier to cast. Maybe we can go full mono white in the end, actually, thinking about it here. I don't know. Some of our best cards are red cards, though, like Chandra, Ember Cleave, Inferno Titan. Definitely not going to have a lot of red in here, but... There's a Contorius as an option too, but I think all the other red cards I listed are just better. Alright, so... It is awkward that our best red cards require two red mana, they require double red. Because we could easily go for like a 10-7 split, 10 plane, 7 mountains here, if it weren't for that fact. Yeah, I think we are going to... Mainly cut red spells like Chandra, Flames of the Firebrand, Light Up the Stage, Mishra's Command, Rampaging Raptor, Dragon's Rage Channeler. Oops. Yeah, I want Rampaging Raptor as my companion. Uh, and Grim Lava Mancer. Yeah, not a lot of red spells. Still going to make the cut in the end. 
but there's multiple double red ones, like Emmercleave is basically 4 mana also. But I guess that's still kind of a finisher, right? Red is just all of our finishers, so we don't need double red till, till late game. We're at 17 creatures, plus History of Benalia. That's like um, 18 creatures. Legion's Landing is like 19 creatures. So we can cut a couple creatures out of here and still be at 17, which is pretty high. So yeah, mainly... I don't know, 19 is not that insanely high for aggro. It's going to say mainly cut creatures, but we actually can cut kind of whatever we want between creatures and non-creatures. But we do have some like really small creatures for an aggro deck, like Spirited Companion. Sorry. She is the goodest girl, but she is not a big doggo. Other cards that aren't that great for aggro. Inspector-ish, Micaeus-ish. These are both really good with Lurus, though, which is fun. They add to the Kellen count for card draw, too. Those are the two, like, next worst creatures to maybe cut, but I'm going to start looking at the non-creatures. Maybe we'll cut enough of those. Um, and we can cut a land here. We a 16 land deck. Slightly awkward with the one six drop, but it's one six drop. That's the important number there, one. So we don't need that much mana that often. Yeah, our average is 2.5. That's pretty dang low. So ditch a mountain. We're at three more cards to cut. So our slowest, least efficient non-creature cards here. I think in the trenches fits that bill. Anthems are... It's generally not the greatest cards ever. The kind of cards that don't do anything inherently by themselves. They're all about supplementing the other cards you have, making your other cards better. Kind of what makes them a little weak. So for that three mana, it's just not the best impact. And then six mana for removal is pretty bad as well. You stack the two together and it's better than either half individually, but still not very good for a deck that needs to just be about pure raw efficiency for the most part. So I'm going to take In the Trenches out. Um, the best thing about Urbrask's Forge, again, is the resiliency against board wipes, the power level against control specifically, and I think our deck's doing pretty decently against control. We have a few things going for us. So one of them is that we have two really big equipment, Maul of the Skyclaves and Embercleave, so that if we're getting enough aggressive attacks in early, we can start just casting some of these equipment, maybe, instead of just playing more creatures into board wipes. And that helps uh, have some creatures left over to play. And then any creature we play that has a Maul the Skyclaves on it or an Amber Cleave on it is going to be a massive win condition later. I think those may give us some resiliency against board wipes. Uh, but also the Legion's Landing, if we can get that flipped, then that can keep spitting out creatures. They're not going to be as big as the Forge creatures, but Forge is pretty slow for the non-control matchups. If it's aggro versus aggro or if we're just versus mid-range, it's just not much damage output very quickly, so cut the forge here, and then one more card to cut. I don't have a lot of removal here, but I still think that March of the Otherworldly Light is pretty inefficient. We need to throw like all of our cards at our opponent as quickly as possible, so we're basically never wanting to exile a card for this to reduce the cost, so this is always going to cost one mana more than whatever we need to deal with, which is hard to justify. Like, if our opponent's on the play, this is going to be really bad. Because if they're on the play, then on their turn four, they play a good four mana blocker, and this is my only removal spell in hand. I can't do anything with this till turn five. I have to spend five mana to kill their four mana blocker. Now that is unless I exile a card from my hand, but then I two for myself really bad. Yeah, I think we cut that as the final cut. And hope that Ossification, um, Lightning Bolts, Mana Tithe is enough interaction there. And I mean, I guess there's also Bone Crusher Giant and also Heart Flame Duelist. So there's two more removal spells than it looked like. Yeah, that's not horrible at all. Also Inferno Titan, but that's very expensive. I don't know if I'd count that one. Um, yeah, I think I like those kind of last cuts here, and 
we will call it a deck here. All right, here's a look at our final deck list for today. We're on a really sick Boros aggro deck. We're close to mono white, actually. We're definitely much heavier on the white than the red, but we do have a nice little spice, a nice little flavor added with our red spells. So a lot of the best white aggro threats, cards like Adeline that spit out an entire army off of herself. And she's also just a massive threat alongside your army, usually a very high power vigilant threat. We've also got History of Benalia to help spreading out with a wide board state. We've got Maul of the Skyclaves that can turn any creature we have into a gigantic threat. Same with cards like Luminarch Aspirant that keeps buffing up whatever we need to. And a couple ways to keep that path clear with cards like Ossification to exile their really big threats. Maybe a Mana Tithe, well-timed, can stop our opponent's board wipe and really get them. So really nice stuff from the white half of the deck. And the spice that we're adding out of red is just a few of the best red cards in the cube. Ember Cleave to win games out of nowhere. Chandra for extremely powerful flexibility, being removal or card draw or damage or Mana Ramp. The Mana Ramp part doesn't matter for our deck, but... The card draw or damage from the plus one and the removal from the minus three are both great for this deck. Uh, and then, of course, just the best red card, Lightning Bolt, the classic, the original, the very fantastic burn spell. So really powerful stuff with this deck. I'm pretty excited to see how it does. So without further ado, let's just head into the gameplay, see how it do. Here we are on the play for game one. This is a pretty awkward hand that we don't have any creatures. But we have really good interaction. We can try to just win off a of Chandra, so I'm going to keep it. I'm not in love. This is not our deck plan. But as long as we're not against control, we should be good. If we're against control and we just have two removal spells and one Planeswalker, they just counter this and then we lose. It looks like we're not against control. They're going to start with a Dragon's Rage Channeler, which is fine. I don't think I need to insta-bolt that. Could instabolt that. They are blue red. Okay, that could be kind of controlling. Oh, Inti. I do need to instabolt. Dauntless bodyguards the draw. I will pay four life to kill either of these creatures. So let's attack with Vanguard into this. They are just not gonna block. So let's bolt Inti. It's the scarier card. Putting plus and plus some counters trample onto their board. Now could ossify channeler that's not necessary though so let's just bodyguard world's most awkward dauntless bodyguard because we're just protecting something that doesn't need any protection it already has its own indestructible ability but that's just kind of the order we drew them in okay ledger shredder i might ossify although i have got chandra mana so we'll just chandra the Ledger Shredder. <gasps> no, I shuffled away Adeline. Why do you have to show me that arena? Because I didn't even have to crack the Fable Passage till this turn. Because once I have a fourth land on board, uh, it would have untapped the land anyway. Arena's so rude. There's just no reason to do that. Show me the Adeline on top. Um... I'm not going to attack with Dauntless Bodyguard here, weirdly enough, because this makes it so if they try to removal spell Vanguard to hit Chandra, then we can sack the Bodyguard rather than using Vanguard's ability, because I think you have to tap this. Okay, no, you don't have to tap this for its own ability. Well, either way, we can just make Vanguard indestructible and then block if they try to channel her into Chandra. Okay, this was the one thing that made me think maybe I should still just attack both here. It's like, they can probably just burn spell Chandra anyway. So, but this way they had to burn spell instead of attacking. So they had to spend a card to get rid of Chandra. So probably worth it all in all. All right, I still don't hate the trades here. They're down to 10. They're a blue-red deck. Hopefully they can't board wipe. There are some red board wipes, though, like three damage to everybody or five damage to everybody. Definitely not anywhere near as uh, as many as you have in white and black. Those are the big board wipe colors in this cube. I'm 
White for sure. White has, what, like Day of Judgment and Saddle the Wreckage and Wrath of God, I think. Black has Languish, Gix's Command, and Meat Hook Massacre. And I think red just has two. I think red has the five damage to everybody and the three damage to everybody. So, still definitely an amount of board wipes, but not an insane amount. Ooh, Micaeus. Micaeus, I want to play you as a 2-2 so I can draw a card. And then I still have Ossification mana up if that is relevant. Oh, <gasps> no! I should have held double red up, then they'd just be dead to Embercleave probably. All right, well, I mean, Ossify's fine here, I think. If I don't get board wiped, they are mega super extra dead. Will we ever trade Dauntless Bodyguard for Dragon's Rage Channel? We will. There we go. They are down to five and incredibly dead to Ember Cleave, giving plus one, plus one, double strike trample. And our opponent doesn't even need to see it. They concede to the onboard threats. We will start things off 1-0. Here we are now for game two with a reasonable start. Not an incredible one. We only have one red source towards the Ember Cleave, and we don't really have a great follow-up to our turn one Usher. Like a turn two 1-1 one, one Micaeus is not really where you want to be. And obviously we don't really want to ossify something on turn two. They're unlikely to have a card that's that valuable to kill, so... Not the greatest hand ever, but that's part of what's nice about Usher of the Fallen, is that you can always just boast with it on turn two. If you don't have a good two drop to play. And killing a mana dork is usually pretty decent, so maybe we are just going to ossify the Pilgrim. Get rid of some of their mana so they're not dropping five drops on us real quick. Alright, well, Pilgrim absolutely did its job, even if it died right now. Playing Elite Spellbinder turn two while I only have one land on board to make my Ossify cost four is disgusting. Very good work from Pilgrim. Good thing I get to slap my opponent in the face with this giant translucent uh, Roman Colosseum column. Sometimes Arena just be doing things and you have to go with it. All right, Selfless Spirit and Beast Caller. Pilgrim has really done its job. Honestly, I feel like uh, we're just losing to Avacyn's Pilgrim. Avacyn's Pilgrim turned one on the play, and they've dumped this much stuff on the board because they're on the play with an extra mana from the get-go. Yeah, I mean, we've got really reasonable cards, but... Pilgrim accelerating them while they're also on the play to be ahead of us is devastating. And I'm pretty sure there's no shot at victory here because we're not going to make it to Inferno Titan before we die. Oh my god. Got a Skyclave too? This is just like the dream magical Christmas land hand from our opponent. No, the reverse Colosseums! The pillars! Um... I cannot profitably block here at all. Because I can only block the 4-4 and I cannot block with 4 power. There's Adeline, which again would have been incredible on the play. But we just fall behind. Twelve life, so I'm not dead. If I try to Chandra anything, I'm only killing a Selfless Spirit, right? If I try to Chandra the 3-1 Flyer or the 4-4, I'm killing a 2-1 Flyer. If I Ossify the 4-4, I am actually Ossifying it. Feels like my best line, but also like it's not enough. And what's really nice about exiling the 4-4 is if we kill the 4-4, like if it dies, dies, it gets to move its counters around, but not if we exile it. Yeah, Pilgrim into turn 2 Spellbinder on the play is one of the best things I've seen happen on turn 2 in the cube, period. 
that disruption is phenomenal. All right, our play lined up exactly as well as we wanted it to. We get to trade with the 2-2, have a 1-1 one, one to block there, 1-1 one, one now. Oh man, a tie, that is not what we want to draw you. I mean, the only line is to Chandra to kill the selfless spirit, right? At this point. At six life, I can't really do anything else. If I don't kill a flyer, I'm going to one. Yeah. Chandra, kill a selfless spirit, then they can kill Chandra really easily. I mean, I'll give them the option of letting us kill the 3-1 instead of the 2-1, but I imagine selfless spirit is gone. Yeah. If they top deck removal, we are dead on board. If they don't top deck removal, they probably put us to three and kill Chandra. Yep. Put us to three and kill Chandra is the play. Sir Joshua and Sir Saxon draws them another creature to play here. Okay. That is... Game. Alright, I just had to make sure that I didn't forget my numbers. <laughs> Five and six. Like, we don't have Inferno Titan mana, right? Even if we did, that's game, because those things are three toughness, and they have battle cries, so they would both attack as three threes on the ground. So Inferno Titan could hit the board, kill their flyer, and shoot them for two, but then I would die. Because I only block one of the three threes on the ground. All right. Yeah, I mean, not much to be done there. I don't think much of that was really gameplay decisions. It was just a phenomenal hand from our opponent. We are one and one heading into game three. Speaking of phenomenal hands, this is not quite there because our white source is tapped, but it's close. If we had a Plains instead of Fabled Passage, this hand would be incredible. The Bodyguard into Robber into Welcoming Vampire with a Lightning Bolt backup. But the hand is still quite good. Ooh. Hand Disruption. And here, as always on this channel, we like to show the correct plays. If you get Inquisitioned and they take your good 2-drop, make sure to top deck another good 2-drop. That is the play, every time. Um, I don't hate the Kellen for Harvester trade here, but I should probably just bolt the Harvester so I can get multiple attacks off Kellen and maybe draw a card. Although, I can also just bodyguard Kellen here. And save the bolt for something else. Trade a bodyguard for Harvester. Ooh, good draw. We are going to Value Town. Alright, well, if they don't block, I'm still just going to bolt Harvester so they can't sack it and kill something. Then for mana efficiency, I will be playing Thraben Inspector, even though that loses the Welcoming Vampire card draw. I have a Kellen card draw engine, and I have a vampire card draw engine coming up, so I can lose a tiny bit of value uh, to play things out more aggressively. Okay, well now I'm sad I bolted, but now we have Inferno Titan. If we hit two more lands this game, I can crack the clue to work my way there, but I should probably just play a flyer first. At least Gix cannot attack into this board. Like, we can't attack into Gix, but they can't attack into us either right now. And this thing is like a card range, and every time they hit us, they pay a life to draw a card. If they get to seven mana, they can like steal some of our cards, but our cards are all pretty small um, in terms of average mana value, so that's not that scary. Wrinkle is scary. 3-3 three, three Flyer with Haste to get right past my Welcoming Vampire, and now they can just make each player discard a card, and we don't have Inferno Titan anymore. That's incredibly rude. That lines up so well for our opponent. Oh my god, yeah, they draw a card off Gix and make us discard a card off Rankle. So they draw and discard a card every turn, and I just straight discard a card. That is actually just more 
just cube magical Christmas land nonsense that I wish we had. But we're just on the other end of the table from magical Christmas land today. Like, our deck is playing out with stronger curves than the majority of the other decks that we've been going, like, 6-3 with. Uh, and we're still dying because our opponents are just doing insane wombo combos. This game is not over, and Aspirant's a pretty good draw. But I don't like the things our opponents have been capable of. I think I have to just slam down landing against the Rankle. I'm gonna let them keep poking me with Rankle rather than putting a counter on Vampire when I get damage in here. No, I actually did want to draw a card off Rankle there. Or Kellen there. Come to think of it, because they're just gonna make me discard it to Rankle anyway. But I don't think against Black Red I'm supposed to put a counter on Vampire and hold it up, because they probably just kill it anyway. I think I'm still attacking with Kellen there, but maybe I shouldn't have played Legion's Landing until post-attack, in case I hit something bigger to cast, like a Lurus. Although I still wouldn't have had the mana up for Lurus. Because I had to Aspirant pre-combat either way. Wolf Spider Queen, that is a nightmare and a half. Two two ones with menace and reach, and if we don't immediately kill Wolf, she's gonna get a bunch of loyalty back as their creatures die and just make more spiders. They're at eleven though, so maybe we just attack them with everybody. They have to block Welcoming Vampire with two creatures to kill it. It's a trade. The trade. Counter on body card, attack all, flip Legion's Landing. See about a race here. Yeah, I'm not in love with our options. I mean, I guess I could hold Thraben Inspector and the 1-1 one, one back, and I still flip Legion's Landing. But I do have to send in three creatures here to flip. Then we just try to get, like, a Micaeus win buffing everybody. Make a 1-1 one, one from Landing and buff everybody with Micaeus. I don't quite have enough mana to do both of those. I guess I do, because Micaeus can't buff everybody till next turn anyway. And maybe that's where we're at. Keep as many creatures on board as possible for the Micaeus buffs. But still flip the landing here. Land to grave. Okay, a trade and a trump that puts Lolth back to three to get two more spiders is annoying. But then Lolth is dead after they get two more spiders. Oh shoot, I guess I am one mana off from what I'm trying to do, because I need three mana and tap Adonto to get the 1-1. One, one. So I could play a Micaeus as a 0-0 zero, zero and still do that, because it's four of my lands I have to tap here. I guess it's Micaeus for two and draw a card then. So I should draw the card first in case it's something better. It is not something better. Micaeus for three, though. At least we're empty-handed, so Rankle doesn't do anything crazy. Oh, 
Go for the card draw here. Adeline actually a pretty sweet draw. Because we're going to get a tapped attacking 1-1 one, one, and then put counters on it with Micaeus. They're down to 7. They're going to have 3 blockers up off of Wolf. They're probably not dead. Yeah, especially with more removal like a braid here. And another blocker that's five, four blockers. So one creature gets in. Yeah, god dang it. Okay, so that's mana for Adeline plus Adonto, which is pretty nice. This is instant speed, yes. Okay. Put a counter on Aspirant, so if they block incorrectly, Aspirant still lives. If they block Aspirant with a spider, there's a chance we still have it around. They have to block multiple creatures here. But one of their creatures survives no matter what. Okay, Aspirin's trading with a Gix. That's not bad. Never mind. They have redone blocks. Oh, Aspirin's gonna live. Oh yeah, they just don't care at all about Aspirin. That's fine. Nope. I'm going to stop speculating until I get to activate abilities. Okay, well, we kill Gix and Preacher here. That's pretty good. It's pretty dang good. Also, we put them to one. They got a response to this? Can they counter this ability for zero mana? That would be impressive out of a Rakdos deck. They can kill Adeline in response. Okay. So we still take these trades and put them to one, right? Yep. Okay. Super close game. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven damage here. Oh my god. The double wrinkle. It's 8 plus 4, which is exactly 12. Oh my god. Please ask me if I enjoyed this game, because I don't think I enjoyed a single second. Nope. They didn't even ask. Well, I don't know what else I could have done for the most part. I think that's about as aggressive as we could have gotten towards those crackbacks. It played out about as well as it could for us, too, with those counters on the board there, getting those huge trades. I don't know. I think that was probably what we were supposed to do in that position, but one and two it is. Magical Christmas land for opponents continues. Hopefully not three games in a row, but we'll see soon enough as we head into game number four. This is our riskiest hand so far, our riskiest keep so far by a little bit, because we do need to hit a white source here to be really happy. Um, but that's not saying much, because the hand is not very risky. Our other hands have just been uh, very good, generally. Uh-oh, I should not have said anything. So we're against blue-white here, so probably blue-white control... So if we stumble at all, that's going to be really, really bad, because the best way to beat these kind of blue-white control decks is to outrace them, try to blow them up before they can get to really big haymakers at 7-8 mana where they can super control the game. All right, perfect, right on time. 
Super scary, but right on time here. I'm going to History of Analia before I Adeline, because they could have literal counterspell here for double blue. I don't want to get Adeline counterspelled. I'd rather run the History of Benali into it than the Adeline. Okay, well now they could have even more counter spells. Let's... Whatever I try to cast here is just not going to resolve, I imagine. So... Post-combat elite spellbinder, probably. That way maybe they spend some mana on instant speed removal, and if they do, then I Adeline. Okay, yeah, so... Spellbinder, get that countered. Okay, well, moment of truth, we get to see what's in the hand then. Oh, it's Pact of Negation! They literally can't counter. <laughs> or they're gonna super die. Well, we gotta get rid of Settle the Wreckage, right? They've got one seal away for tapped creatures and our whole board's Vigilance. I mean, I guess Spellbinder isn't. But then they have Pact of Negation they can actually use next turn. Yeah, we get rid of Saddle the Wreckage, and then they don't have a good response to us just attacking for eight with a bunch of Vigilant Knights, because they can't seal away them. They can't Pact of Negation this ability. Um, do I let them just seal away Paulo here? Probably not. Just put them to 10. You know what's kind of annoying is that they're going to have Pact of Negation and Snapcaster Pact of Negation. Ooh, Narset. Um, sure. Yeah, we're just going to Heart Flame to list their face now. They do still have the Seal Away mana up. That's all they need because the Pact is free until they're upkeep. I don't know, maybe I should have just played Adeline into the packs, because then they tap out and we hit for 7 anyway. 7, 8, 9. Almost lethal. Actually, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yeah, we probably could have killed them if we just cast an Adeline and they packed it. Because they'd have been tapped out, and then we hit for 7 and 3 more, that's 10. It's Bone Crusher the face. Yeah, we're going to be one damage off lethal. This way. Oh, my tap land. Yeah, they still don't have more lands in hand, so if I just play an Adeline and they packed it, then cool. They are tapped out next turn, and we just kill them. If they don't pack the Adeline, then they're also having a really bad time. All right. I was going to say, I don't think it matters where I point Paulo, because I'm pretty sure they're just going to seal away while I have the mana up. But I will point Paulo at Narset to send a message. I'm not going to go for the onboard lethal, because I know if I attack you for lethal onboard, you'll just seal away Paulo anyway. Alright, so they didn't pact, which means... 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. They have the 6 mana up for Settle the Wreckage, so we attack in so that they tap out? No, because then they just have Pact. Shoot. Shoot. Well, they have to settle these two. Oh, I should have attacked with just a 2-2 two because -two, Adeline has a trigger. But this way I'm threatening them for lethal and Narset for lethal. <laughs> Okay, cool. So they aren't tapped out from counter spells because they have specifically Pact of Negation, which I need to keep reminding myself. 
Oh, and I just had three creatures. I could have gotten three lands. This has been a punty game. <laughs> All right, well. Let's just cast Chandra so that they have to pack that. And then they tap out next turn. Unless they top deck a land, they won't have the mana to Snapcaster the Pact of Negation. And then we can kill them, kill them with Heartflame Duelist. Right? So weirdly enough, Chandra is the bait to get Heartflame Duelist to resolve. Um, but also, I guess, um, also if they pack, they have to tap out and just die to our board too. So I guess it doesn't really matter. I could play like a complete buffoon in this game. Our hand is just good enough. And I kind of have. That's just how we roll, right? Play the worst in the games that we win and play the best in the games that we lose. Let's go. Show me what you got. Because your settle's gone. You don't have the mana to snap cast your settle. All right, cool. We are two and two heading into game number five. Here we are for game five, kind of slow for a hand here. We're not really doing much till turn four, because even History of Benali hasn't cast both with another white source. I'm actually going to mulligan this one. This is also slow. I swear I drafted plenty of one and two mana cards. I just don't know where they're at. I kind of want to ditch a land. Because I need to draw another white source for my first threat here anyway. But then I need to draw another red source for Embercleave. This is just going to be awkward no matter what we pitch. Yeah, this hand is somehow worse than the first one. But probably not worse than a five card hand. This hand does not give me confidence at our odds this game. Huh, they never expect the mana tithe. I think I have to kill the mana ramp here. We don't want a repeat of what happened when our opponent Avison's Pilgrim does turn one. Well, that's a very weak draw, but at least it's castable. So our opponent's green-blue ramp, which means they're just going to make it to like six or seven mana and then just completely destroy me. I will interact as well as I can until then. Well, Luminarch Aspirant's probably the best two drop in the deck, even if it is not the land for Luris. Or the Maul, even. Tireless Tracker, excellent value play from our opponent. Gives them one clue minimum. Come on, land. Yes, let's go. Um, buff the bodyguard and send it in. Then if they trade it into tracker, I can recast it off Luris later. Actually, kind of like playing Maul here, because then I can play Luris and recast bodyguard in the same turn. Which would be real spicy. Because I can't actually recast Bodyguard right now. So let's maul up the Aspirant and attack both. Buffing the Bodyguard to make it very tempting to kill it there. There's Nissa, which is a Lotus Cobra. So they get mana when they play their lands. They've got two cards in hand. One clue token. There's an Iron Crag for more mana. I mean, it depends on what that last card in hand is, but we might have a shot here. If the card in hand is a six or a seven drop, six and seven mana spells in cube are insane. 
Okay, it's just another mana dork? Let's go. Alright, well I hit another land, but it's not a white source, so I don't get to Luris recast Bodyguard here, so that's kind of sad. I do still get to just play Luris, which is fine. On board, we're just winning the game with just an Aspirant with a Maul on it. Next turn, I can just attack with two creatures and I can Ember Cleave for four and kill them with the Aspirant in the sky with Double Strike. Oh dear. Oh dear. That blows up our Maul of the Skyclaves. And then it starts making 8-8s eight on the ground. 7-7s seven on the ground. Oh dear. Oh dear. Oh dear. Okay, so they're at 10 life. If I attack them with both of these, one of them breaks through for 8 damage, which doesn't kill them. But it puts them to two. If I attack Nissa with both of these, I get to kill Nissa. But then they're still alive. I guess they're still alive with only a Bramble Familiar on board, so we're probably supposed to kill Nissa here. Because I can't imagine they're going to have much better odds of stabilizing than slamming down 7-7s seven every turn. I do not love this. And I guess there's also the hedging our bets really dumb idea, which is to put a counter on Luris and attack them with Luris, and if they don't block specifically Luris, then they die. Let's get stupid. I'm going to attack them with both here, because if they on board, they can block Aspirant and kill it. Oh, <laughs> that was actually a very smart play from our opponent. I was going to say, on board they can block Aspirant without losing a creature, so it's such a tempting block for them to just block the Luminarch Aspirant. But if they do that, they die to Embercleave. They don't do that, they go to one. But they're not dead, so... The safest play, regardless of our opponent's choices, would have been to just kill Nessa. But I feel like this this made it very easy for my opponent to misplay into losing the game. They didn't. So they have they have earned their spot. They'll be here. And things are looking real bad for us. Because now the Niss is gonna stick around popping off. Okay. I mean they need to top deck like a champion again now because Nissa can't do anything about the welcoming vampire so they have to draw removal for this or they have to draw well I guess I give it indestructible um, they have to draw a reach creature actually oh my god now if we make it to 8 mana they also die they're at 1 life so I'm not going to buff vampire anymore I'll just keep buffing our life linker I don't actually think I want to attack with Lurus, though. Because then I just trade Lurus for Lovestruck Beast. But Lurus' ability is really nice. If nothing else, I can sack Bodyguard and recast it to draw a card looking for more mana to get to Inferno Titan. Their poor flooded strand. Very fitting name. It's stranded on the board because they don't have the life to use it. All right, this is going to start making some giant blockers. I mean, did they draw exactly a reach creature? Because almost anything else doesn't work. They did not. All right, so they are dead to the welcoming vampire. <laughs> Go out on their own terms, cracking the flooded strand there. Really did not expect the win there. This is probably our most awkward keep so far. 
mold a six. It wasn't a great six card hand. Luris was like the only threat, but we had some real solid draws and our opponent's keep wasn't much better. They had plenty of little mana ramp cards, but they didn't have anything to ramp into. So by the time that they drew into their giant threat, their Nissa, we had already drawn into plenty of threats of our own uh, since they didn't get to really play Nissa until like turn seven or eight or something. So, all right. I don't think I played that one out correctly. I really liked the idea, right, that attacking with Aspirant Luris, like they can kill Luminarch Aspirant without losing their Nissa. So it could tempt them into that block, but obviously they were not tempted. So in hindsight, it was definitely better to just kill their Nissa. But also, just the risk free play was to kill the Nissa. Because no matter how our opponent plays, we get to kill Nissa if we attack her with both. So, probably should have done that there. That was kind of the only line that I think could have been different from what we did for the most part. Everything else worked out well, I think, but thankfully, we still do get there in the end, drawing into the flying threat, and we are 3 and 2. Hold ourselves back out of the 1 2 hole into at least the 50 50 run here, but we'll see if we can take it any farther as we head into game number 6. All right, here we are for game 6. 2 drop, 3 drop, 4 drop. That's a curve. We are on the draw. Against the deck starting with a Triome, so probably somewhat controlling. We do need a second uh, mountain to get to the Chandra. Which might not happen. I'm going to play Paulo before uh, welcoming Vampire here so we can see exactly what's going on with our opponent. Looks like they are pretty multicolored. Yeah, probably five color when we see red, blue, white, red, black, white. I guess we haven't seen any green sources yet because the fetch lands don't really count. You don't have to be playing green for that to be a good fetch. But then they play History of Medallia. Strange. Not the kind of card I would really expect from a four or five color deck. Red, black, white. I guess they're red, black and white aggro. All of these cards are really annoying. The Aristocrat is really difficult to deal with. The Edict is just going to kill Apollo and then Siege Gang. It's the most expensive card, but those goblins can kill a lot of our stuff. I think we have to just get rid of Aristocrat here, though. Let them Edict Apollo. I'm already going to be behind from this history of Benalia, but I'm going to be massively behind. They followed up with a 4-1 haste indestructible flyer. Now they have to just cast a 2-drop on their turn 4. They top decked another castable spell. They were holding there for a while, so it looks like they did. Please tell me it is not removal for Welcoming Vampire. Okay, it is not. So we do get to draw the card here. Go down to 13. This is going to be a big chunk of damage. Is power to a less right? Yeah, so Kellen draws me a card off of Welcoming Vampire as well. Ooh, Intrepid Adversary was their draw last turn. Buff their board even more. That's real gross. Guess this isn't going to chump more damage any time in the future. Could stick around to help flip Legion's Landing, but it's going to be difficult to attack in with three creatures soon as well. I think I need to chump. Oh, goody. That is actually awesome. Um, so I can Inferno Titan next turn. That will be a very big deal. If I Chandra now, Chandra's just going to die. I guess I could Chandra and Kellen, and Chandra's at 5 loyalty. And I've got 2 blockers up to protect her. That is interesting to me. 
Five loyalty, two blockers up, block, block. She takes three. But then I lose Welcoming Vampire in the blocks. I don't think that's worth it. Let's just play Kellen and see what we draw. But then I don't have Chandra mana up since I didn't play Chandra and add the two. But I feel like Chandra just dies if I play her. So let's not do that. I'm going to threaten blocks here. So that maybe we get hit a little less hard. Because I feel like we're just all in on Inferno Titan. Yeah, they didn't even attack. I feel like if I only left back a 2-3, then we would have taken 6 damage there minimum. So that was awesome time. So, Inferno Titan, 3 damage split where I want it. That's going to be... I want to kill the Siege Gang Commander so they can't kill any of our stuff, but I also want to kill Adversary so it's easier to kill their other guards. They top deck a land, and I shoot Adversary for two and a Goblin for one, then they could spend their turn sacking the Commander and the two Goblins to kill the Inferno Titan. But then they're just down to two 2-2s two -twos on board, so that might be okay. And if they don't top deck the land, it'll be great for us. I think I'm going to go for it. Two to Adversary, one to a Goblin. If they don't top deck a land, this will be awesome. If they do... Then, uh... Goodbye Inferno Titan, but also that takes their whole turn and all of their Goblins to do that. Now we are attacking with Welcoming Vampire since 2 threes beat 2-2s two on blocks, so we're already scaring them off of attacks. They keep looking at Inferno Titan. That makes me think they might have the land here to, to triple shoot. It would be worth it if they had the land, because if they don't triple shoot Inferno Titan, then I'm just going to attack and kill Siege Gang Commander anyway. I'm going to kill even more of their board, because I shoot Siege Gang Commander for two, a Goblin for one. And then they have to, like, block with a bunch of stuff. I guess they could just hold all the mana up so that when I attack and try to kill some Goblins, they respond by shooting. Oh, Goblin Bombardment. That is very interesting. That would explain all of the math going on in their head right now, because that's, that's a lot. Okay, so they can already throw these goblins around for two damage apiece, so I think we block block here. Which means sack sack, that's uh, that's two damage to Titan, they need to do four more, but they only have three mana. So they can do two more sacking another goblin, but then they have to goblin bombardment twice to finish. I think we just do this? Even if they do have some like really tricksy way to kill Inferno Titan here... It's going to involve wiping almost their entire board, and then we take over with Chandra from there. Oh wait, yeah, they can just let this deal the damage and not sack it, and then that's three. And then they sack both the goblins here. So we get rid of everything but the Siege Gang for the Inferno Titan. I don't know why I didn't see that line, but that is what I was talking about with like, we're going to wipe their entire board and then just Chandra them to death here in order for them to kill Inferno Titan. Yep. Yeah, I think we're definitely ahead in this engagement, but obviously I don't look very smart <laughs> in that I didn't see that exact line coming, but the thinking of letting them spend everything to kill Inferno Titan um, was accurate. They did have to spend everything, and that is fine for us. If I minus this Chandra to try to kill Siege Gang, then they kill Chandra um, by sacking the Siege Gang. So we are going to exile. Find a Luminarch Aspirant. Okay. That is worth playing. That's going to make them just Goblin Bombardment the Aspirant right away, basically. But I draw a card off of casting it, too. 
Yeah, the value train is incredible here. So yeah, now we just... We basically killed the Siege Gang Commander and drew a card by plus one in Chandra. Which is a really good deal, even if we don't get to keep Luminar Aspirant. Okay, if they hit a land, they can haste out their, um, their flying haste thing. Hit Chandra for four and then sack it to finish Chandra, but then they have n literally nothing left. They have their top deck and that's it. And I have two card draw engines. Now you're asking for it. Yeah, again, like we're letting them kill our stuff, but that's because we're in a position where we have several card draw engines and they have none and we're forcing them to constantly two for one themselves into our cards so we just come so far ahead in these exchanges now we get to flip legions landing too i will keep a zealous conscripts All right, there's the concession from our opponent. Now that game, there were definitely a lot of lines that could have been played differently, but we played just aggressively with all of our tools because we were so far ahead in card advantage the whole game. We were just like, yeah, that's fine. We can let them kill our stuff by throwing a bunch of theirs at it. Played as aggressively and quickly as possible, really, in that one. We could have played a much safer, slower game and still probably had the same outcome because we had so much good stuff there, so there's definitely alternate lines that were solid there too. But not unhappy with the plays there. I think they were all reasonable, making our opponent two and three for them, three, three for one themselves and two Inferno Titans and Chandras and stuff. So four and two it is. Now a positive win rate no matter what as we head into game number seven. All right, here we are on the play for game seven with our mono white aggro deck. Let's go. Sorry, robber of the rich, but you're not invited to this party. Flooded strand turn one from our opponent doesn't mean too much because again, the fetch lands can pull out almost any triome. So they're not necessarily blue-white. They did grab a blue-white triumph. It's blue-white and red, so... Now we do need to be a little concerned of them being some kind of blue-white control deck. We've got a really good hand um, for seeing exactly what's going on because we have Paulo, but we need to draw another land to do that. Oh, blue-red at the core. Ooh, that was not a good draw. Um... I might have to crack the clue and really hope to hit land three here so I can still play land for turn. I'm tempted to play Micaeus and put another counter on him so he's a 2-2 so we can put a counter on the rest of the board, but I can't really miss a land drop here. So even if the clue doesn't find a land, it gets us closer to one. Yeah, and if we didn't crack the clue, then it was about to be multiple turns from hitting land. Feels like just a necessary use of our mana there to crack the clue token. It's an electrolyze, kill the aspirant, draw a card. Very, very good interaction here, especially with Iconoclast on the board to spit out the 1-1s. One There's the land. 
now we can elite spellbinder them. Luris is pretty awesome here too. We probably save that for like a five mana play. Play Luris, recast an aspirant is what we do when we have five mana. Till then we keep slamming down our other threats. All right, this is a scary matchup. So they have double red because they have Triumph plus Sulfur Falls, and if this Bone Horde Dragon sticks around, we cannot win. Because we can't attack through it, and it's just so much value. But they also have a Snapcaster to go with their Electrolyze, which is really good against Elite Spellbinder with that one toughness. They've also got a Heart Flame Duelist to just kill any of our threats. I don't know if we can win here against this, but I think our only bet is to not just run into a Bone Horde turn 5. We are never breaking through that. Yeah, this is not good for us. That hand is really, really good against us. At least they're down to 11. And they can just Cyclonic Rift our Inspector to make it a 1-2 again. They are going to Heart Flame Duelist the Spellbinder, though. Fair enough. Guessing that means they didn't draw 5th land. That's not an untapped land, which I guess doesn't matter, actually. I mean, I guess I could have Robert Rich plus a Danto Vanguarded here, which would have been really nice, but... Not as big of a bummer as I was thinking. Chump block for the turn. Drop welcoming vampire. Yeah. Pretty sure. If we hit land five, Luris, and then play the thing. Well, literally couldn't have seen that coming. Because we looked at the hand and it wasn't there. That was a top deck last turn or this turn. That's rough. Lose the one flyer. Now we can't lure us and then start putting counters on it. Probably just dead now to Iconoclast. Alright, well. Thought I was dead when I saw the hand. I had one turn after I saw the hand where I was like, okay, maybe... We're getting semi somewhere here, uh, but no, I mean, we're just super losing at this point. Sadness. Yeah, so they've still got the Snapcaster Electrolyze or Snapcaster Volcanic Spite in there. Stoke the Flames, my 1-2. That is just rubbing it in, really. With the lifelink from the Heart Flame Duelist to get way out of range. But spend the 4 damage burn on my 1-2. Is a play. Shoot myself in the face for four to kill another 1-1 one -one here. I guess. That is not land five for the Lurus chain, so we can make a 1-1 one -one Machaeus and a robber, or we can Lurus and make a 1-2. So we just get the one two again. I still have to be just on blocks here.
Yeah, a couple awkward things here. I think they've just got a lot of great cheap interaction against our kind of deck. And we stumbled a little on mana early. We didn't hit land three on turn three. We had to even crack a clue and still didn't hit it turn three, which was super, super awkward. Meant we spent turn three not even impacting the board. And then, of course, just not having cheap interaction for Iconoclast means they just have an infinite wall. Kind of like our first two losses, this was just things kind of playing just really well in our opponent's favor. I don't think there was anything we could do. This time, though, our deck did stumble a bit. Our first two losses, it was like our deck was curving out better than, again, the vast majority of our other Arena Cube decks. Like, it was doing really good stuff really quickly. Our opponent's decks were just going even nuttier. This time, uh, this time there was some stumbling, for sure. Yeah, I mean, now they're just so stable, we'll move on. That is going to end the gameplay. We are at four and three, sadly. Not a terrible run, but feels a little sad for this deck. Uh, the first two losses were the ones that felt super, super sad, because I think we had pretty good curves, played pretty decently, um, but our opponents had just excellent, excellent stuff going on. So couldn't quite get there here. Just four and three, just a little above average in terms of win rate and everything, which is on the lower end for our Arena Cube runs this time around. So while it is technically above average for the general the general win rate of just an average player is literally 50-50. It is below average for how we've done this season, which feels sad, because I think this deck is better than some of our other decks. I think it's a pretty sweet one. Just really didn't get to shine as much as possible. Is there anything super awkward here? Any big over or underperformers? Not really. Mana Tithe was a bit of an underperformer. Um, we just top decked it late game when we already lost one time. That was the only time. I'd say it underperformed just because it was like, well, it doesn't help at all in this kind of position. Um, Overperformers. Not really. I don't think there's anything that did like way better than I thought it would. I guess Kellen. Kellen was a bit of a like, I mean, I guess it works with all these cheap creatures, but Kellen was consistently drawing quite a few cards and the surveilling was nice too, milling extra lands when we didn't hit creatures off of Kellen. So Kellen was actually a pretty big overperformer there. So, and that's about it. Micaeus was like a little awkward and dirtily, but did do some things. So that's about how I evaluated Micaeus in the first place. So that's about the same. Yeah, I think everything's about how we thought it would do. But Kellen for a bit of an overperformer and Mana Tithe for a little bit of an underperformer. The deck as a whole, a little bit of an underperformer. I would have expected another 5-6 win like we've been getting recently, but we are down a tiny bit in value. But at the end of the day, still get most of our gold back and some random card rewards. But that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for supporting this channel, as well as you for watching the videos. If you enjoyed this video and are interested in seeing more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more on your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.